There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I am bitterly disappointed that I can't take you outside with me this morning, but it is raining. I woke up at 6, peeked my head out, put my hand out the window. It hadn't started raining. I rushed around, got my books, got my microphone, had a shower, and stepped outside 15 minutes later. It was raining, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon, and here I am. Kenji's in the shower, so I want to start this because... My breakfast is also ready. My rice is made, and all I have to do is grill the salmon for about 10 minutes. But I don't want to eat, because as soon as I eat, I get sleepy. Especially now that I'm especially still dealing with jet lag. Um, I'm happy to say that my jet lag has been the mildest. It has been in years, in five years. But, anyway, <laughs> I'm still not at peak form. But really disappointed to be sitting in here. I am paradoxically, but definitely characteristically pleased to tell you that the Empress of Bailing is back with a vengeance. She has made up for lost time. I haven't had very many bails in the last few weeks, but this week I had, are you sitting down, four! So let me tell you about those first, in no particular order. I bailed on this piece of shit. Stay tuned for Doris's and my very objective, <laughs> fair and balanced review coming soon. And uh, I wrestled with this and ultimately bailed on it. Natalia Ginsburg's family lexicon. And I just couldn't get into the groove. I read about 40% and it just was too cartoonish for me. I couldn't stand the father who was yelling at the top of his head at everybody about absolutely everything. And yes, it was cute that he had his own, the whole family had their own private lexicon and words meant things differently. Uh, there was a racist one that I talked about before, but the rest of them were not like that. But you don't get to know anybody just by their eccentricities. It held my interest to a certain degree. I smiled a couple times, but ultimately the old man drove me around the bend, and I knew that where it was going was that this family was going to have to deal with Italy. They were a very anti-fascist family politically, Jewish. The father was Jewish, the mother was not, um, and they were going to move through that phase of modern Italian history, and I assumed it would become more serious, but by about, I can't remember if it was 40 or 50 percent of the way, and I just thought, you know what? I don't care about any of these people. I've smiled at their eccentricities three or four times in a hundred pages, but I don't care about them. So that was when I decided to bail. Natalia Ginsburg, I gave you an honest try, but I'm done with you. Nice cover, though. I started and quickly <laughs> abandoned uh, a novel, a Canadian novel from Quebec. This was a buddy read with Leah and Hebert's Camaresca. Best cover ever to come out of Canada, I think. And it was so terrible that I wanted to vomit by page 15 and put it down and begged for Leah's forgiveness for having planned this buddy read for a year. We tried to, we wanted to do this last Women in Translation Month and didn't get to it, and it's always been there. I've had this book on my shelf for three or four years and uh, never bothered to preview it. Why didn't I do that? Because it read like a shitty Wilkie Collins novel. All melodrama and ellipses and exclamation marks of this really over-the-top, maybe murder plot or menage a trois, jealousy, love triangle, something murder poisoning her husband. It was so stupid. I mean, plot sucks when it's like that with no character development. I didn't know who these people were and she's poisoning her dying husband. And it's so stupid. And the writing was just blah. So... 
Luckily for me, Leah, who never bails, said she was dying to bail too, so we bailed. Together. <sighs> Another uh, book that I bailed on, it was an ebook on Scribd, and I forget. Oh, it was a cousin of Always Doing bailed on it, and the way she described it, it was an Egyptian novel. I thought, ooh, I can see why Cousin wouldn't like it, but it sounds like something I would really like. She said it was kind of too literary and the prose was a little too precious or something. I forget her words. I don't want to put words in her mouth. So I tried it, and uh, no, it wasn't for me. Uh, it was awful writing. Two Women in One by Nawal El Sadawi, and I had tried her other famous book, I forget the name, it doesn't matter, of just a few weeks ago, didn't like it. So I've given up on her or her translators. This was a different translator, so I thought I'll try it, and I liked the maybe page one, and then by page ten, I read 12% of it, it was just overly metaphorical and uh, way too poetic, but incompetently poetic. I use the term in my Goodreads review, metaphor, diarrhea, so ugh, abandon that. So those are my four. Pretty impressive, hey? I have started quite a few, too. Let's see. This is my second novel by Yugo Tsushima, Child of Fortune. And I love this so much. I'm only on page 20 of, 100 and, of a 150-page novella, but just like her... Uh, novella that I read last year for Women in Translation Month, Territory of Light, I just sink into her world on page one. There's, some, there's a lushness that I don't usually associate with Japanese literature with which Tsushima spins her narrative that I just fall into, and it's so persnickety and grumpy and not always kind, but but yet just human. I, I, I'm stretching for adjectives here. I love it. This is about a another single mother, but this one, her daughter is about 12, and her daughter and her have become a little bit estranged. The aunt, the, the protagonist's sister, has kind of won her over, and so she's actually living with the aunt and visiting her mother. And there's all kinds of memories of when the daughter was a, a, a toddler that are delightful to read, and the way that Tsushima's playing with time and playing with light and snow. It, it's really working for me. I'm only a bit into it, but I'm loving it. And maybe most momentously, I have started volume one of Anniversaries by... Uwe Jonsson. And this is volume one. Together, volume one and two are just under 1,700 pages. This is a year-long buddy read with Peg the Book Prize Addict. Our, I can't believe that we love each other as much as we do, and we have yet, we have never done a buddy read. This is our very first, and this is a year-long commitment. And so far, fantastic. This is in the form of daily journal entries over a year from August something something 1967 to for, for the following year of a german woman and her young daughter living in new york city daily entries about a page page and a half so it's not much in the way of a daily commitment but it's a year-long commitment i i've loved the first three or whatever four entries i've read uh, peg and i will be checking in with each other on voxer uh, every sunday and there is also a Read along sponsored by I don't know I remember I don't remember the pronunciation Mooks and Gripes something like that I'll put the link in the show notes Peg has talked about it and I'll be following their book blog commentary but the buddy read is just between Peg and I and I'm looking forward to checking in with her on Sunday I hoped that Leah and I could substitute that awful Canadian novel with something else, whether it was a Women in Translation book or not. And we settled on one that was not a translated book, and that is a Persephone book, Vain Shadows by Jane Harvey. I believe it's pronounced Harvey, because I encountered this surname, Harvey, in the audiobook of Clarissa by... Is it Samuel Richardson? And there's an Aunt Harvey, and it's pronounced Harvey. So I'm going to guess that this is Jane Harvey. A 1961 novel, which is quite late for a Persephone book. Usually the ones I'm familiar with were originally published in the 20s and 30s and 40s. But anyway, this is 1961, and we started it yesterday. We had 
had it on our buddy read list, just hadn't scheduled it. I am now well into it and really enjoying it. I don't think I'm loving it, but I'm really, really liking it. This is really sucking me in. The old colonel dies, and I think it's around the time of publication, like it's in the late 50s or whatever, and his children are middle-aged, and his wife is pretty happy <laughs> that he's kicked the bucket, and the story's going from there. Sounds like it pretty cliched, but it's not so far. I'm enjoying it. I wasn't sure in the first few pages, and I thought, oh my god, I can't bail on Lee again, but no, 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 it's good. I'm enjoying it. So that's what I've started, and I realized that I've got it up, the order all jumbled up. Just welcome to my world. So now let me tell you about the books that I have finished, because I have finished a few. On the way back uh, to Japan from Canada, I finished that Welsh novel, Feet and Chains, by Kate Roberts, translated from the Welsh by Katie Gramich. And I gave it four stars, because there was things about it I loved. It's not a great novel, but it's a good novel. There were things about it, like I say, that I loved and, th and some things that were quite disappointing. So what I loved were when Kate Roberts painted a scene, it was uh, unforgettable. It opens with a scene of a um, chapel, outdoor chapel service that was so beautifully done. And there's a funeral scene when the grandmother dies and there's a handful of other uh, vividly realized scenes. The problem with this novel is there's not nearly enough of them and there's way too much exposition where it's like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, but she, it, she's telling, not showing. So that makes it a, a weak novel that I would still say is worth reading. It's a, it was a four-star read when I tallied everything up in my subjective pea brain. The writing slash translation is quite good. The family dynamic was the most well done. That was a pretty uh, conflicted family with lots of antagonisms and grudges and whatnot. And that was really well done. Kate Roberts showed how the experience of being impoverished, this farming family, not only farming, the father also worked in the mines, how that constrained and shaped the individual members of the family but Kate Roberts got too preachy and essayistic and political and would just use her characters as mouthpieces for her political agenda which made it uh, again a weak novel the ending was awful because of that yeah very disappointing ending I don't care about endings when I think about the totality of it and it was a quick, breezy read. Oh, the other thing that was really subpar was as an ebook, I don't know about any kind of printed book, but as the ebook, there were footnote asterisks, and you had to go to the end of the. There wasn't a clickable link, fine, but when you went to the end of the ebook to find out what the footnote was about, I would say 30 to 40% of them, there was no footnote. There was nothing. Like, what? That's just so crappy. So I'm sounding more lukewarm than my rating is because of the, how much I loved the things that I loved. But um, people talked about Kate Roberts being a world-class writer, an undiscovered world-class writer. On the basis of this, one of her only novels, I would say that is a definitely an, an over-exaggeration. But I also have heard more about her short fiction than a, a, about her novels, and my theory is you're either a great novelist or a great short story writer. Not both, so her short stories are hard to find, not not in print, in English particularly, and I will track them down, but I'm not in a great hurry to do so after this somewhat disappointing. Uh, I mean, for me, a four-star read is a, is a disappointment. You know, there's I usually have more negative than positive to say about a four-star read because I'm only here really for the five-star read, so. There you go. But I did finish that. I started and finished two short novellas for Women in Translation Month, one of which had been on my TBR, one of which was not. I felt my TBR was overly European and overly white, and so I, I added something at the last minute. But So I'll, I'll start with that. That is a novel from Senegal. So long a letter. The author is Mariama Ba. 
born in 1929, died in 1981. I think she had only two works of fiction. I'm not sure if the second one was a novel or short stories, but this was a novella published in 1989, at least in English. I gave it four stars too. So there was things that I really loved about it and things that weren't as successful. So that ends up being a four star read because the things that were good were really good. This is a story about a Muslim Senegalese woman whose husband takes a second wife and abandons her. Not legally, not, there's no divorce, but he just completely moves in with the other wife. And the other wife was their adolescent daughter's best friend. <laughs> and it's a first person narrative in rather clumsily structured as a 80 page letter to her best friend and again very similar to feet in chains there are some scenes here that are unforgettable and i was also just like i was interested in welsh life from the late 19th century up until world war one in the welsh novel i was very interested in the polygamous reality for a senegalese woman and the timing of this one was closer to modern times, independence, and then post-colonial era. I didn't know a blessed thing about Senegal. It's made me curious for more. But what was fascinating was the protagonist, she was writing this letter to her best friend, and her best friend's husband had done the same thing to her, and she, the best friend, left left the family and struck an independent path and so that tension not that there was conflict between the two women there was not but that contrast between the two women was one of the most fascinating things about this novella and again the family conflicts and stuff were really well described but even more so than the Kate Roberts novel, there was a lot of eye-rollingly, it was well-written, extremely well-written, but eye-rollingly essayistic writing about the position of women in society and stuff that was all, you go girl, I agree with you, but this is way too pronouncement -y for a novel. But I still really enjoyed it because it was fascinating, the story of her. She, I, I loved the protagonist, and I was so fascinated by her friend, and I wish to hell that it hadn't been a letter to her friend, but that we would have been able to see the two lives and explore this more uh, fiercely independent uh, best friend and her realities because she... She ended up working abroad, but she did still live in Senegal. She was quite audaciously courageous in just walking away from her polygamous husband. So it was really interesting. It's an 80-page novella that anybody could read. It's on Scribd that people who read the books in one sitting, I never do that, but it's possible to. And I'm so glad I read it. Oh. And translated from the French by Moldupe Baudet Thomas. I also read a Norwegian novella that I did mention on my TBR. The Faster I Walk, The Smaller I Am by Gersti Anastater Skomsvold. Translated from the Norwegian by Carrie Pierce. This one was less successful. And I really struggled between a three and a four. You know, these are my struggles. <laughs> but I gave it a three because it was a bit of a dog's breakfast and the flaws were so egregious. But there were things about this that I deeply, deeply loved as well. So I'm giving you a qualified recommendation. It's a quick read, but it is just a hot mess of a novella. And I didn't think the writing was all that fantastic it's overall. It's about a woman who's, I think she's 99, and she's having some dementia, and she's living in her memories, and it's never really clear for much of the novel whether her husband is alive or dead, and she's contemplating taking her own life or what people will remember her by. It was a childless marriage, 
but she, she is so weird and the really movingly affectionate relationship she had with her husband is so fucking weird that there were parts of this that just filled me to the brim with joy. One of the things I'll never forget, it sounds mundane, but the way it's described, it's what I will always remember about this woman, Mathia. Mathia? Mathia. She's 99 and she's, you know, kind of a recluse and she she goes out to the supermarket and buys a jar of jam or pickles. She can't open it. It's too too hard to open. And she's too shy to ask the cashier guy to open it for her before she goes home and she's like, "Oh." <laughs> but just we so many weird things that I loved, like the eccentricity. I talked about the Ginsburg memoir that people call a novel that I'm that kind of drives me crazy Britt and I are going to be reading some autofiction next year so I hope to develop either a critique or an or a uh, enlightened acceptance of this blurring of the lines between memoir and fiction because it's uh... anyway where was I going <laughs> I complained about the eccentricity of the Ginsburg that that was just became cartoonish here it didn't it was the part of it that was the most moving because there was an emotional component to the way she was telling the stories of how she and her husband met when they were very very young and just how weird she always was and Denver wanted to leave the house during the long long marriage and there was other things where there was a crisis in the marriage that just but I gave it three stars because it was so uneven and there were just eye-rollingly bad and boring or confusing, needlessly confusing passages. I think maybe the author wanted us to experience the protagonist's dementia, but it wasn't well done. So it was just seemed like sloppy writing in places and it particularly near the end. There were things that I just really didn't like. So a really mixed bag. But if you don't mind a mixed bag to to latch on to those uh, scenes and those a anecdotes, those moments that really captured my imagination and in many places captured my heart, I, I, I kind of recommend it to you. I'm glad I read it. So those are the three that I finished. All right. So... I'm not going to speculate. I've got one more week of Women in Translation Month. I have a whole bunch of things on my TBR, and to be honest, I'm kind of rebelling against following my own self-generated, self-created TBR as closely. Sometimes that happens. I know it happens to a lot of booktubers. It doesn't happen to me too often, but I so I found a bunch of new stuff. The two biggest novels that I'm enjoying the most the Norwegian novel by Cora Sandell and the German novel by Anna Sagers. I have decided I do not want to finish this month. They're too good. I want to slow right down. So because I'm planning to slow down, I may finish one or one of them over the la remaining week, but I, I just want to savor those. That I probably have room for a few, one or two or whatever, smaller n novels or something, but I'm not going to speculate about that. So, thanks to my good habit of bailing on shit. I've had a great reading week. How's yours been? Thanks for watching.